Hey everyone, welcome to October 6th uh, MakerDAO community call. My name is David Utrobin. Uh, I do community development uh, at the Maker Foundation and have been a longtime MakerDAO community member. Uh, and today is going to be a really good one. So if you're new to the call, uh, first off, welcome. Happy Tuesday. Hope you are having a good one as I am. Uh, and so, yeah, so this call typically we do a few different things. We try to give uh, viewers of the call and participants of the call kind of an update on what's going on in the MakerDAO universe week to week. Uh, but when we have interesting guests or interesting demos or interesting things happening in the ecosystem, we always try to put that first and uh, kind of give a, a, a more interesting and hopefully more valuable experience to anybody who's watching and or participating in the call. So today, uh, and by the way, if you do want like the weekly update on the MakerDAO universe, uh, we have a really great group of contributors uh, here at MakerDAO. They produce something called the Maker Relay. Every Monday evening, they post it. Uh, and there should be a little button. If you're here watching live on Crowdcast, there's like a little Maker Relay button right underneath where my finger is pointing. Uh, and you can click that, and uh, it will take you to the Maker Forum where the relay is posted. And I believe this week's, uh, this week's uh, Maker Relay is episode 15. So check that out. Um, but this week we're going to have a really great, um, a really great kind of demo Q and A session uh, with Ed Nopal. He is, uh, he, he run, he does a lot of. He's an MVP. He, this guy, this guy is big business. But uh, uh, he's going to be running us through the uh, uh, the auction keeper uh, because very soon uh, we are going to be seeing the surplus buffer uh, hit the maximum number at two million. Uh, and past that, uh, every 10,000 die is going to go to uh, a surplus auction. And uh, and I think that uh, this demo is coming in uh, very timely for uh, for anybody in the community who's uh, who's technical, who uh, is interested in participating in these auctions. Uh, this community call is for you. Uh, and so, if you can't catch it live, don't worry. Uh, if you need to go. Don't worry, this is all recorded, and we will be posting this on uh, on YouTube. So uh, you can always come back to it as a reference if you want to play around and try to get set up yourself. Uh, so in just a moment, I'm going to uh, actually invite Ed Nopal onto the screen here. So there you go, Ed. I think uh, you should have the request there on your screen. And yeah, and then I'm going to just give it to Ed. and. Um, uh, just as a reminder, so this is a uh, this is a community call. It's meant to be a conversation. It's meant to be pretty laid back. Uh, feel free to type your uh, comments, questions in the chat. Uh, I'll happily relay them to Ed. And likewise, if you're not camera shy and you're interested in actually coming on and and like speaking face to face with Ed and and uh, with anything regarding this demo, feel free to just ask in the chat and I'll happily connect you guys. Uh, so with that being said, hey Ed. How's it going? So, David, I do have one question on Crowdcast. How do I share a particular window on my screen? So when you hit the share screen button, uh, it should prompt you similar to Zoom where it'll say application window or like full screen. Sure. Where can I find the share screen button? So if you scroll uh, at the top, like uh, a little bit above where your actual like faces, like the middle screen here, there should be a share oh, screen. I see, I see. Yeah, cool. Okay, cool. How's it going, everyone? Um, I am going to share one particular window here. Um, what I've done, I've put together like the simplest example of a shell script that can start up the keeper. Um, and it's a bit easier to configure than it was uh, at the beginning of the year when we had our first round of uh, flop auctions going on. Um, so. So I do have a quick question, Ed. So I, I know that there was the uh, original like uh, auction keeper uh, reference implementation, but then you uh, the team put out a Dockerized version of that. Uh, is uh, can you uh, explain a little bit uh, about around the context of like the Dockerized versus like the direct reference implementation? Reference. Yeah. So the the Dockerized version makes it a little bit easier for someone to set up. Um, uh, several keepers, each running in their own Docker container that are bidding on the various collateral types for the collateral auctions. Now, I don't believe that 
those containers have support for, for uh, flap and flop auctions. That's surplus and debt auctions yet, um, but they have been maintained every time we add new collaterals. Um, the, that repository gets updated. And the nice thing is that repository also feeds right off of whatever the latest commit is from the master of Auction Keeper. So it implicitly gets any updates that we make to Auction Keeper. Got it, thanks. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Well, I, yeah, okay. I kind of can only talk to you, David. I guess that's the the downside of the crowdcast thing. Can't really get feedback from everyone, but uh, as, as long as you're looking at the chat, uh... that's true. Okay, so to answer Dave's question, I'm currently estimating the first auction to happen around 1 p.m. UTC on Friday. Now, of course, that can change based on how much dive people generate, um, but you know that's just my estimate right now. So let's just say end of the week. I'm going to make my window a little bit smaller to try and fit more text in uh, for those who might see it at a lower resolution or have a smaller screen size. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay, so um, I'll assume everyone is like somewhat familiar with bash scripting, um, but what I've done here, this is just the shebang to tell the script where my bash is located. And um, this is just a, a file that I have to keep my environment variables. So there's only three environment variables that I'm reading in this file. This is basically the URL to the node. Um, this is the account that I want to use, the Ethereum account that I want to use for bidding. And this is uh, a link to the key file. Um, so basically any of the keepers that use PyMaker, they have this syntax where uh, it gives the path to the JSON file, a delimiter, and then the path to a password file. Um, so why don't we actually look at this environment file here. Now, um, this example uses a, uses a quick node URL, but you can replace this with um, any, any kind of node that um, supports the full JSON the RPC URL. Um, I think that Alchemy has a product called Supernode that supports the, the full JSON RPC spec. Um, I think uh, there's actually a couple different node providers that are in the README for the Auction Keeper that we've, we've tested and we know support it. Um, but also if you're running your own parity or your own geth, uh, that should be fine as well. Um, you do need a full node, not a light node. Um, you can't support the full JSON RPC API on a light node. Um, but yeah. And this is just the Ethereum address. And there's no private information here. This is really just a link to the JSON file with my key and a link to a file that has the password for this account in it. Okay, so going back to the shell script. So we configure the type of auction to be a flap, a surplus auction. We set RPC host to the URL of our node, um, and that should include the port. So in this case, if we're using um, quick node, it's just implied that the port is 443 because it's the, the, you know, the SSL port. Um, some nodes will require you tack on a, a port at the end of it. And uh, over here, we're specifying a price model. So um, Banteg from the community, he actually prepared this um, example price model for ETH, and there's a link for that in the uh, Auction Keeper README. And what I've done is I've adapted that example for flap auctions. Um, since flap auctions were bidding on die using MKR that we possess, um, we're gonna want an MKR price with um, die as the quote token. Now, in this example, I'm actually getting the coin gecko price for MKR with USD as the versus currency. So it's up to you whether you want to do that adjustment for, you know, from 1.00 to 1.01 .01 or whatever the price of DAI might happen to be on Friday. So, to, um, 
To explain how the price model works in Auction Keeper, um, the, the way that it does interop with the price model is it uses standard input and output, and it sends a JSON message in, which basically defines the parameters from the auction, and in response to that JSON me uh, message that it gets in through standard input, it's going to spit out a very simple JSON response that just has the price in it. So what I'd actually like to do is just kind of demo the price model on its own. So I'm just going to call model flap here. And we're not going to pass any arguments for it, right? Because that just starts up. And it's not going to do anything until we feed it some JSON. So in the readme for the auction keeper, it's kind of nice. The example in the readme of a message is actually for a flap auction. So it's a little convenient. I'm just going to paste in, and you can you could pretend that the standard input is coming from the keeper itself, and then hit enter, and it produces a price. Now, just like Banteg's example, this is a 15% a discount, but for flap auctions, discounting it kind of works the other way, right? Because um, if we want to inflate the price we want for Maker, it's going to be a less aggressive bid, right? So I think in, in the example for flip auctions, the discount was being subtracted. In my example here, we're adding it, right? Because there's an inverse relationship. And so let me just rephrase that to make sure I'm getting that right. So because you're bidding uh, with MKR on a stable price, uh, you know, a stable lot of die, which is 10K, your bid is competitive in your uh, assumed maker price. So you want to assume a, uh, a slightly cheaper price than market in order to effectively get an arbitrage, right? Well, actually, since you're looking at the maker price, right, you would estimate that maker is a higher price towards the beginning of the auction mm. um, because that would be a less aggressive bid. And then as the auction progresses, you get closer to market price to make a more aggressive bid. So why don't we actually take a look at the source code so I can show that inverse relationship. So in Auction Keeper, there's a file called strategy PY. And um, basically for each of the different auction types, there is a strategy, right? And we're probably used to looking at the flipper strategy for collateral auctions, but today we're looking at the flapper strategy. So when we get to the bid method here, we're taking in this price that we got from the bidding model. And we're taking that lot, which in our case, it's going to be 10,000 die as currently configured. We're dividing it by that price and that's going to produce our bid price. So this line here is just making sure that the bid price that we have proposed exceeds the bag which is the, um, the, the bid interval, right? And right now I believe that's set to 3%. So if it meets that 3% and it's a valid bid, it's going to make the tend call, which is submitting the bid. Just reading over the chat to see if there was uh, any questions. Okay, so to, for Dave's question, um, the way it's going to work is it's going to auction off um, 10,000 die at a time until we get back to that surplus buffer. So right now the surplus buffer is set to 2 million. So the first auction would happen at 2 million 10,000. And, um, you know, it, it'll sit there until, um, you know, that 10,000 is auctioned off. And once it gets back up to 10,000 again, um, another auction can happen. Can there be multiple auctions at once? Yes, there can be multiple flap auctions simultaneously. If we are accruing more than 10,000 die debt over the six hour, or sorry, more than 10,000 die surplus over the, um, over the six hour period that the auctions will happen. And I think that that's likely because I think right now we're accruing at a, a rate of, um, uh, I think 80,000 a day. So, yeah, I think usually we're going to have like 1.2 auctions going at a time, I think. And yeah, Catflip is a great site for looking at those parameters. 
and it has the Etherscan links too. So you can actually click on the Etherscan link and then click on the contract from Etherscan and then click read contract. And then you can read the actual values. You just might have to divide by 10 to the 18th or 27th or 45th based on what the numeric type is in the contract. But uh, that, that, that's a good source of truth. Diego also asked, uh, is this expensive in terms of gas price? Well, it, it's certainly not free, right? To submit the bids, you are going to spend gas. Um, it's difficult to estimate what gas prices will be like on Friday. Um, but in, yeah, I mean, question inside of the strategy, uh, is there an ability to kind of read the current like gas price and build it into your bid or like basically like deduct it from your bid in some sort of like automatic way for the bot? Yeah. So we used to um, advertise a feature in the model where you could put a gas price here, right? But then the problem is the keeper is kind of beholden to that gas price. And if, if kind of the, the market gas price moves away from that, you're still locked into it, which is why we never want the model to have the gas price. Instead, the keeper itself actually has some somewhat sophisticated facilities for transaction management. And uh, why don't we talk about those? Um, so in main PY, if we look at the argument list here, there's a couple of different arguments we can use to get a source of gas price. And I'm going to demonstrate getting one from the ether chain gas oracle. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw this in here. And what that's going to do is instead of getting a, a gas price from the node, it's going to get a from the Etherchain's gas oracle. And then the keeper also has some default configuration for adjusting the gas. Now, this configuration works regardless of whether you're using an oracle gas price or if you're using the suggested gas price from your node. So the first one I wanna talk about is initial multiplier and that defaults to one, so it doesn't do anything unless you tune it. But this is just saying, hey, take the price that's coming from my API and scale it a certain way. So some people might want to set that to like 1.1 um, to, you know, be 10% more aggressive. But, you know, in the context of a six hour auction, probably not quite as important. Um, the more important one is the reactive multiplier, right? So this is set to 12.5%. And the reason that that's important is because parity nodes actually ignore um, any gas increase in the mempool unless it exceeds that 12.5%, um, you know, delimiter, right? Uh, I think geth, I think geth is still 10%, but you know, highest common denominator wins here, right? We wouldn't want to alienate the, all of our parity nodes by just increasing our gas by 10%. And then, you know, only the parity nodes reconsider the, the replacement transaction. So what this is gonna do is every 42 seconds, if the transaction is still sitting pending in the mempool, it's gonna submit an automatic replacement of that transaction. And it's gonna do that whether it's an approval transaction or a bid or a request to create a flap auction or to deal your flap auction. And since you're doing all of those activities from the same account, that's important because we don't want that account's transaction queue to back up. And we have a, another important safeguard here, which is a gas maximum. The re, one of the reasons why that's important is, you know, not just for, you know, limiting risk on bad API gas prices, but let's assume that you've submitted a transaction from this account from something else. Like before you started the keeper, maybe you ran a transfer in MetaMask with it, right? And maybe you used way too low gas in that transfer. So you've got this, this nonce on your mempool that has too low gas. When the auction keeper starts up, well, actually there is a new feature I wanna talk about, but um, when the auction keeper starts up, you don't want all the other transactions in the queue to be constantly replaced over and over again, um, you know, producing some ridiculous gas value. 
So this is here to kind of safeguard those transactions. Now, a new feature that was added to the auction keeper is an auto plunge on startup. And I don't think I've actually talked about this in a call yet. So when the keeper first starts up, it's going to look for pending transactions. And let's, let's actually scroll to the code for that. Here we go. So what it's going to do, it's, it's going to see if there's any pending transactions in the mempool on the current node that you're connected to. Keep in mind, if you've submitted a transaction, you know, using the MetaMask example again, if that transaction was submitted on MetaMask and, um, you know, that went to some Infura node, which uses a different mempool than the one that you're on, then this auto plunge facility isn't going to be able to take care of those pending transactions for you. But in like a FUBAR situation where you've submitted a bunch of bids and the gas just doesn't make sense anymore and nothing's getting mined and you connect to that same node again, this is going to flush all those transactions from the mempool one at a time. It's going to wait a bit to give any other pending transactions that might have good gas a chance to get mined. And only after that process is finished and the transaction queue appears healthy, on your particular node, will it continue to go through the, the state machine of the keeper? So I think that's a, a really cool new feature. That'll basically uh, enable you to reset your keeper in the case that all your transactions are getting stuck, right? Yeah. So like in the example where, you know, when you first start the keeper, you've submitted a couple of bids and the gas is at like 100 guay, and then something happens and suddenly, uh, gas prices shoot up to like 300. Well, um, if for whatever reason you believe your transaction queue is stuck or you think the keeper gets in a state where it's not replacing anymore, or if you accidentally control C the keeper, right? Because I mean, if you close the keeper, it can't replace the transactions anymore. When you restart it, it's going to flush that queue and only after the queue is flushed will it resubmit all the transactions that you need. That makes sense. Yeah, so I, I know that during March 12th, one of the big uh, issues for keepers is that they had all these flushing them. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, because I think Plunger um, hadn't been actively maintained at that time. And, you know, I wasn't personally aware of... Uh, the, the process of plunging transaction queues. But yeah, we, we built this into the keeper now to try and mitigate that. Really cool. Okay, so we, we've done an example of the price model. Let's go ahead and do an example of the keeper, right? So I'm just gonna have it on screen on the left hand side. Let me clear this out. Okay, now remember we added this ether chain gas price, so we're going to be getting an Oracle gas price now instead of using our nodes gas price. So it's connected to the Oracle and it's got a gas price. Now, notice it doesn't actually log what the gas price is it's getting from this Oracle because there's really no reason to do that right now. It's not going to query that Oracle for the gas price until we actually need to submit a transaction. It's not like you first start the keeper and it just caches whatever the price is. That wouldn't make sense. Yeah, that wouldn't be efficient. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, now it's, it's doing a couple of things. It's checking for opportunities to flap. You know, it's looking for, hey, has the surplus exceeded 2 million or actually 2 million 10,000? And it's also looking for open flap auctions that it can participate in. And, you know, haven't hit 2 million yet, so we can't start auctions. And um, there aren't any active auctions, so it's just kind of going to sit there until Friday if I leave it running, basically. Well, I don't have any maker in this account anyway, so it wouldn't do anything. But I think you get the point. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, those are the, the basics uh, behind running a keeper. It's really not any more complicated than that. Um, I think uh, in David's Twitter message, he posted a link to Auction Keeper. The README 
has all the details for setting one up, including example for testing your price model. There's a link to Bantag's flip price model if you want to modify that, or you could develop your own price model. Um, there's an example in the README of using a shell script for a fixed one. Uh, and while that's the simplest thing to do, it's not great because you can't actually change the price in real time. And hey, over a six hour period, it's reasonable that you might want to adjust your price. Um, so yeah, if anyone needs any help on that, I generally monitor the Keeper channel on Rocket Chat and uh, happy to answer any questions anyone has on it. So what are uh, some of the other necessary things that you have to be running in order to run the Keeper? Um, well, I guess probably the biggest thing is a node, right? And running an Ethereum node is, is kind of expensive to do. You need, uh, you should probably have dedicated hardware for it, so a VPS, unless you want to use a third-party node provider. Um, the one I've used in the past is QuickNode, uh, and I have tested that with a Keeper. Um, but you do need like a reasonable pricing plan to have enough bandwidth to run one of these Keepers. So, you know, as with any Ethereum project, you're, you're kind of limited to your access to nodes. Got it. And if you want to run your own, keep in mind it's not just the, the cost of the VPS, it's really the cost of the, the network transfer. That's where you're going to spend your most money. Uh, it's probably going to cost you upwards of 200 USD a month um, for the combination of VPS and network transfer that you need uh, to run a full node. One nice thing, though, you don't have to um, you don't have to sync the entire universe, right? You can do like a warp sync um, back to you know some reasonable time in history um, to first set it up. That makes sense. So there's a few questions in the chat. So Frank asks, how important is price discovery to have a successful flap? Yeah, so that's interesting. So as we burn MKR, one would assume that the value of the existing MKR would go up. And hopefully the lot size that we're auctioning off is so infinitesimally small compared to the amount of uh, maker that exists that um, each auction wouldn't really impact the price that much. Um, so looking back at our price model, right? I think I said before that um, you know we should probably have DAI as the quote currency in that pair. Um, but yeah, I think the the number of participants will be interesting to see um, how many people are actually going to be bidding their MKR and you know trying to liquidate their MKR essentially to to get the stablecoin back. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of don't think that the MKR is terribly affected by any one particular auction. And since the auctions are happening slowly because of the lot size, um, you know, I think the, the impact on MKR price will be equally slow. That makes sense. I hope um, that answers your question, Frank. Now, regarding the UI, I am unaware with any UI that exists for manually bidding on these auctions. I think it would be great to have, and it'll be interesting to see if one shows up by Friday. Yeah, I remember that uh, back in March, there was an effort to create a UI to participate in the collateral auctions. Right. Uh, and I believe that, yeah, I'm sure that there will be something in the future, but not in time for like these first auctions. Uh, my question to you, Ed, is, if there were to be a UI where, you know, just a retail regular person not running a node, not running a keeper can just go connect their MetaMask and like do bids manually just like that. Uh, uh, in light of the fact that keepers, bots are actually also bidding, uh, what do you think the probability is of like somebody using a UI like that to actually win an auction? I think in the context of six hour long auctions, I think it's pretty good. I think what we'd see is towards the end of the auction, we'd see a lot more participants. Maybe at the beginning of the auction, um, people who are running this 
reference implementation of the keeper, they could kind of get their lower bids out um, and, you know, take kind of a, a high discount on it just to see, hey, you know, if, if there's no other liquidity at the end of the auction, I could get a good deal on getting rid of this MKR. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, I think towards the end of the auction, like within the final minutes, that's when people could go into uh, like an auction UI and, you know, use a high gas price and aggressive bid and, and try to get some of that MKR. Makes sense. Or sorry, get some of that die. <laughs> Makes sense. Right, right, right. Yeah. You want to give away some MKR <laughs> or sell rather. Uh, Diego asks uh, votes. If the auction takes a couple of hours, is it worth doing it manually? Oh, cool. Yeah, so I basically kind of asked a similar version of the question. but Well, I mean, another way of looking at that question is if you didn't want to do it manually through a UI, you could implement a price model that uses the timestamp to figure out when the end of the auction is. And if the number of seconds remaining for the auction um, goes below a certain number, then submit your bid. So I guess that's not manual. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, another option. Or you could simply write your own um, bidding mechanism that lets you type in your bid price. And only once the bid price is there, does it actually submit the bid. Yeah. So uh, I know that liquidations 2.0 is on the short slash medium term roadmap for the smart contracts team. Do you see uh, any thing in liquidations 2.0 that would upgrade upgrade the surplus auction mechanism as well so um i haven't really seen any information of liquidations 2.0 outside what's been shared with the community but from what i've seen the clip contract it's only for uh, collateral auctions so i don't believe that there's any plans to change the imbalance auctions that's the flap and the flop um, as part of liquidations 2.0. Got it. Got it. Do you see uh, the possibility of something like a Dutch auction uh, making this process more efficient? Or in, in general, what are your thoughts on uh, in the future making surplus auctions more efficient? That's a good question. Um, so I think in the current paradigm, I, I guess this goes back to the price discovery question, right? Um, so I think there is an opportunity here and that contract that contrasts with the debt auctions because in the debt auctions, you can't really have zero bids because you're starting with a fixed price right. and all of the bidders come to the table with decreasing lot sizes here. That's not the case. Um, someone could just very easily come up with bidding one way of maker. And if there's no other participation in the auctions, um, then, you know, essentially you'd have a zero bid again. Um, so, yeah, I do think that um, a different mechanism might be useful for this type of auction, um, but I haven't really put any thought into what the mechanics or details of an implementation for that might be. I got you. So that, that's interesting. So you, you mentioned that the a very low bid is the, uh, effectively like the zero bid analog for surplus auctions is still possible uh, with like short bid durations. And I noticed that right now the surplus auction bid duration is actually not six hours. It's actually 30 minutes. Uh, I well, think that's the bid duration. The auction yeah. duration itself is six hours. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, okay. All right. Right. So, I mean, oh, no, the auction mind, duration, if somebody so does the... a low ball bid, um, yeah. then yeah, someone would have to counter that bid within 30 minutes. Um, but. I see that the auction duration is actually three days for the surplus auctions. Oh, okay, sure. Similar to the debt auctions, yeah, they're both three days. But the debt auctions, um, they, uh, which the debt auctions are, I believe, uh, collateral auctions, right? Flops? Or no, flops are when MKR is issued, right? Yeah, so flops, you're minting MKR in exchange for die that actors are bringing to the table to try and cover that bad debt. Right. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Then Catflip is missing uh, flip auctions in their uh, system parameters page. 
Um, well, there's a different flip oh, contract for collateral type. So when yeah, you look yeah. at the collateral information, you get Yeah, it. no, you're right, you're right. I actually see it now. So yeah, each of the flip auctions are set at six-hour bid durations and six-hour auction durations. Got it. So the surplus auction duration is three days. Okay. All right. Yeah, my, my, my brain is making sense of this now. Cool. Just looking if there's a... Uh... Okay, so how many bids would we expect till the final price is discovered? Well, I think that's going to depend on the number of actors and how aggressively they bid. Um, we don't really know. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see when these auctions start, uh, how many participants are coming to the table. Um, so we realize that not everyone just has an endless supply of uh, MKR to bid on auctions. So, um, yeah, you know, it'll be interesting to see um, what price is and what the price variance is auction to auction for these. Yeah, so if you guys are uh, sitting uh, watching the call live, feel free. Uh, I'm going to kind of give it maybe two or three or four more minutes, depending on uh, your appetite for questions. Uh, Ed, how can people reach you outside of this call? Uh, I'd say the Keeper channel is probably the best vehicle. Um, that way, if there are questions, I can answer them right there and uh, kind of share with the whole community. Got it. I posted a link to that channel in the chat if anybody is interested in hopping in and asking questions if you're trying to do your own setup. All right. All right, cool. Oh man, so now we're struggling with the, the rich, awkward silence problem. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, cool. Yeah, it looks like uh, the chat is uh, pretty quiet, uh, which is a testament to your awesome expl explanatory skills, uh, Ed. Um, you you definitely, I definitely learned quite a lot uh, from your demo and from your run through of the code. Um, and yeah, that that's that's cool. I think uh, I wish uh, I wish I could uh, run a node at home and run a keeper, but as like me being like a not hyper technical person uh i feel like the biggest kind of obstacle to running a keeper in this way is is really the the needing a node yeah so, so i actually nice tried that test. once yeah. and i should say I, I tried it twice um i tried running one at home uh and this was just a coven node mind you and um the limitation i hit was my isp they actually uh, cap your data transfer at like two terabytes a month. Oh, wow. So, and yeah, I mean, I, I very quickly blew through two terabytes trying to run a node. Wow. Um, so, you know, then I, I tried to set one up on DigitalOcean and then realized that, okay, well, I've got $240 a month worth, worth of VPS expenses before even adding in the network bandwidth. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's just expensive. And, um, you know, I so I guess it makes sense, like the people who are going to be keepers, it makes sense if they are already doing uh, other keeper-like activities. So like if, if you participate in collateral auctions, like it's probably, since you're already doing that, you might as well run a keeper, uh, a, flap, uh, a flap auction keeper. So yeah, that's I kind mean, of like the best crowd for it. Yeah, if you're already doing things like... Uh like automated liquidity farming, or if you have some sort of bot to do leverage trading and you're running your own node infrastructure to do so, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Otherwise, um, I think you'd have to look at the cost of the third party node provider like QuickNode and try to reconcile that over the profit that you think you'll make. And um, mm. for Flap, it's really kind of hard to see what that potential profit might be um, just because the, the flap history that's available is, you know, a little bit old um, and, you know, was against different MKR prices. Right. Um, but, I mean, you could look at flip auctions and the kinds of yields that people have been getting from that 
and see, hey, you know, do I have enough MKR to make it worth my while to participate in these based upon, um, you know, the, the prices that have been obtained for um, collateral auctions. Yeah, that makes sense. So how would the ARB go? Would uh, Does it matter at what point and at what price the keeper acquired the initial MKR that they're bidding with? Or is the idea that the second they get the 10K uh, die, they just repurchase uh, their MKR plus whatever uh, extra spread there was? Uh, yeah, so I mean, if we're looking at it from a perspective of an MKR holder, who's long an MKR and their position is larger than what their desired position is, it just kind of makes sense to use that as, as a way of liquidating that MKR for a stable coin um, to reduce their position to a more desirable value. Now, another use case would be someone that, um, you know, they're just looking for an arbitrage, right? So maybe they're actually purchasing MKR to participate in these auctions with the understanding that, um, they're going to get die from the auction and then swap that die out for more MKR to participate in the next auction. Or maybe they want to convert it to ETH and open a vault so that they could participate in collateral auctions. Or there's, there's almost endless use cases. Maybe they want to take the die that they win from these auctions and, you know, yield farm it somewhere. Right. There's, there's just so many use cases with DeFi that, you could look at the auctions uh, in a context of trying to make a profit on. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, another question. Uh, so, what are what are the trade-offs between having the surplus auctions actually go through an auction where it requires bidders and there's like real price discovery versus doing something just like an auto, like having the protocol just automatically just buy 10k of die. Uh, on it on like Uniswap or something and then just burn burn it that way. So like basically what's what's the trade-off between a market order and doing it through an auction system? Oh, you mean like like selling the the surplus die in Uniswap? Yeah. Okay, so it would sell it and then there's another token on the other side of the pair, right? So what do we do with the token it's for? How do we use that to return value to the MKR holders? Do you right. mean that it trades through ETH? So, like, I know Uniswap, everything kind of goes through ETH. So you would be selling 10K DAI into MKR, it'd go through ETH, but then the MKR that the protocol acquires is just burnt. Right, and then what would we do with the ETH, I guess, is the question. So you wouldn't actually end up holding ETH because it just trades through ETH? Like, uh, oh, you mean, okay, so you yeah. want to I thought liquidate. I thought that's what you were saying, yeah. Yeah, you, you'd want to, you'd consider liquidating on like a DAI MKR pair yeah. on Uniswap, right? So if you sold the DAI, you would get that MKR back. The MKR would stay in the protocol then, right? Um, and, um, you know, I guess instead of, you know, if, if bad debt ever happened again, God forbid, mm -hmm. um, you know, we could use that MKR for the debt auctions rather than minting it. But the problem is, in the meantime, we're not actually delivering any value for MKR holders, right? The idea of burning it is that everyone who holds MKR reaps the benefit from that right. because, you know, there's a smaller supply of MKR. So the value over time is going to go up. I get that. So what if uh, what if there was a module where uh, in the case that there is a lack of uh of uh, keeper liquidity bidding on surplus auctions, it does this market order where it liquidates the DAI for MKR, and then it doesn't hold it in the protocol's treasury, but rather it actually does like initiate a burn function and like still does the burn. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So when we get the MKR, the contract would simply burn that MKR. Yeah, basically um, the same burn, everything except instead of an auction, it's just a market order on a DEX or something like that. Okay, so um, someone would have to submit a transaction for that, which would cost gas. And I'm not sure who would really be incentivized to do that. Maybe MKR holders would be. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. And another thing, I'd worry about slippage, right? So yeah, when we're points. doing that trade on Uniswap, we're going to be impacting the price of the MKR. And it might not, you know, there, there might not be a way to, for the market to understand hey, the MKR from this trade is going to be burned, but 
we're still selling the dye for MKR and that in, implicitly reduces the price of the MKR in the pool, right? Does um, it? I thought it pushes it up because you're liquidating dye for MKR, so it's like a market buy, basically. Oh, right. Okay, so yeah, you'd be selling the dye in exchange for MKR, so yeah. MKR would be leaving the pool. So yeah, that would increase the price. Right. Yeah, cool. I'm just uh, exploring some. some no, it's, it's not about curious. ideas. Yeah, yeah. Just as a secondary fallback mechanism, because I know that one of the one of the uh, big things is you know keeper liquidity. So there is an ecosystem of keepers in uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem, right? Uh, but it's there's no guarantees and there's no like very clear transparency about what they're prepared to do, and auctions are very dependent on the bidders. Uh, and so yeah, I was kind of just thinking in the future, what would be ways to make uh, the surplus auctions more robust, uh, which there's always ways to make different parts of Maker more robust. So yeah, I'm just exploring some ideas. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a good idea. And uh, I'm not sure if like a DEX aggregator might be a better solution for that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I don't have any concerns over the stability of Uniswap, but I'm not sure I'd want to tie ourselves to one particular deck. Of course, of course. For example, like for if we wanted to build something like that that interacted with one inch, for example, um, we could say, you know, market order, I, I want to swap this 10,000 die for MKR. And then when the MKR comes back, we're, we're just going to burn it. Um, right. And then, yeah, really, I guess the, the main downside there would be the gas fee for doing so. It wouldn't be a cheap transaction. Somebody has mm. to submit it. Yeah, so it passes with the gas. So basically with auctions, the gas fee is uh, is taken up by the bidders uh, and the people who initiate the auction. And uh, in a market buy type of model, it would be on the protocol to, to put up that cost. Sure, there and have to be it, some it, solution or some ability to like get the ETH beforehand and like make sure that that you know there's a yeah I get it cool right and for anyone who wants to participate at an aggressive price be sure that you're you're kind of factoring in your gas costs in the transaction as well not not just you know it's not just the the MKR versus USD and converting that to die but you're going to want to subtract out your gas costs to make sure that you're not losing money on it. Um, as with all of the auctions, there's no protection in there that's going to prevent you from losing money on a trade. Um, if, if you want to keep outbidding uh, the other parties and keep you know, specifying a more and more aggressive bid, you're just going to burn all your MKR away and not really reap anything from it. Um, so it's yeah. an important thing to make sure that your model is well tested. That makes sense. Thinking other questions I could potentially ask you while you're here. Um, I mean, we could do some general discussion of auction keeper setup. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Just because I don't think we we've done that yet. Um, you can set up your auction keepers so that, and you know, this this really isn't useful for flap auctions because there's so few of them. But uh, auction keeper has a sharding mechanism now that allows you to run multiple instances of the keeper to cover different auction IDs. Mm. Um, and that's really only useful in sort of like Black Thursday scenarios where um, you know, you're having problems managing transactions, there's too many simultaneous auctions going on, um, but you can configure a, a shard ID and um, a number of shards parameter in the arguments. And there, there's documentation in the readme for this. But that lets you say, okay, I want to take five accounts and I want to have these accounts looking at these different auctions. And you know, it just uses the modulus operator on the auction ID um, to distribute the load across different accounts. Um, and sense. when you do so, you can either um, just configure one of your shards to kick or none of your shards to kick if you don't care about kicking. Um, or you can configure uh, a separate keeper that just does the kicking and dealing and nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, you can configure one of your keepers to deal for all five of your accounts. For example, if you set up five different keepers for ETH, you can have this one keeper that's set up to kick auctions and then 
Um, you know, you provide a list of all the accounts you want to deal for, and then only submit a deal transaction for your own accounts. Um, yeah. Which, uh, yeah, which, by the way, to kick an auction is to start it off. So it sees that a, a, an auction is uh, possible. So it'll see that t uh, 2 million 10 in the buffer and it'll say, oh, enable, you know, or like it'll, it'll kick it off. So that's one transaction. And then anything beyond that are bids, right? Right. And the exactly. deal is like, uh, so is the deal a separate transaction as well? So it's a kick, the bids, and then a deal to close it out. Correct. So what the deal actually does, and you know, I, I probably should have mentioned this before, for all of the other auction types, we're, uh, we're joining some kind of, um, uh, we're joining die to the VAT in order to bid. Um, this is the auction where we don't really have to join anything to the VAT. We have to exit it if we win the auction. Um, but MKR never enters the VAT, right? So the, M the MKR that we have, we're just holding that in our account. And when we submit a bid, the MKR is transferred directly from our account to the auction contract. And the way the mechanics work, if another bidder comes in, that bidder executes a transaction that um, refunds our bid from the bid from the, the flap account back to us, and then their bid takes its place. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I see. Uh, in my head, I ha I'm, sp I'm spinning with potential for more efficiency. <laughs> like there's there's definitely ways to to. I I'm excited for the future of surplus auctions, and the sharding thing is really interesting because, uh, in a world where the protocol is generating, like uh, you know, far far more uh, uh, fees and revenue in general, uh, perhaps like in a world years from now where the surplus buffer might be like ten or twenty or thirty million. And uh, uh, I, I guess I'm kind of curious about what you think the appropriate um, uh, what's the what's the parameter oh, what's the thing in my head I'm looking for the appropriate uh, surplus the lot size. size yeah do you think that ten, like 10k makes sense now because it's unclear what the liquidity and uh, participation of keepers is going to be like since uh, these these flap auctions haven't really occurred very often. But I imagine that the Maker Protocol is going to have kind of continuously running flap auctions for various long periods of time uh, at a time. So I can totally see a world where there's like 10, 10 or 15 uh, uh, simultaneous, uh, you know, flap auctions that are 10K happening, right? Right. So it'll be interesting how we see governance adjust the bump parameter, which is the auction lot size. Uh, in response to being in proportion with the total number of die um, outstanding, um, you know, from the context of sharding, if we wanted to just decrease that number right now, we'd get into the business of having a lot smaller auctions happen more frequently. And then I think the sharding would come into play. Um, that would be a bit less gas efficient because a lot more people would be spending gas on smaller transactions but it would enlarge the audience uh, who can participate, right? right. Not everyone has 10,000. Oh, actually, yeah, not, well, let me phrase it this way. Not everyone has 10,000 die worth of maker sitting in their account, right? right? So, um, yeah, if we wanted to increase the size of the audience, governance could vote down that parameter, you know, cut it in half maybe, and then it'll be easier for people to source MKR um, you know, without impacting the price of MKR to buy it on the open market in order to participate in these auctions. Very interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it is going to be very interesting to see how governance uh, kind of decides and adjusts upwards as the system scales, totally. Uh, but the fact that there is that sharding um, uh, capability is really great for kind of uh, bigger keepers with a lot of liquidity in the case where there's like, you know, a lot of auctions, right? So I think, yeah, so I think it, it, th that functionality might come in handy uh, if uh, if governance doesn't adjust. Or, or may, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot There's a lot to think about there. But, yeah. Cool. Cool. So we got, like, uh, six more minutes on the call. Uh, yeah, so we're not going to be going through uh, making Maker today. So if you're interested in kind of seeing what the current votes are, 
um, seeing uh, the MIPS updates, the different team updates. So um, the Oracle's team, the smart contracts team, uh, and the risk team, they each give an update on, uh, on the Thursday governance and risk call. So uh, that update is captured in the Maker Relay if you are interested in reading that. Uh, and also any like um, collateral onboarding updates, uh, different things that are happening. You could check out everything in the Maker Relay, which is right there. Uh, yeah, cool. And uh, so, hmm, last last few minutes. Let's see. Uh, there, there's like a lot of potential questions. Uh, I'm thinking. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, okay, so regarding, like, uh, setting up and running the Keeper, you need a node. You need to obviously, like, uh, you know, pull this uh, Keeper, uh, this reference implementation of the Keeper. Uh, you have to adjust your uh, pricing model, right? Your uh, Well, you have to create a pricing model, okay. right? So the, the Auction Keeper doesn't ship with one. Um, but like I said, there's links in the readme to several different examples of um, pricing models that could be adapted for flat auctions. Oh, that's fantastic. And of course, another thing that you need is an Ethereum account with some MKR in it. Right. So, you know, not everyone has MKR. Um, and yeah, it's just a matter of how much do you want to buy to participate? You'll, you'll probably want to start with about 10,000 worth um, just so you can you know, participate in an auction, see how much you can get, see if you can win one of them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, try not to have a strategy where you're just kind of wasting gas just to be outbid, right? So, yeah, that makes sense. So I have an OPSEC uh, sort of question for you. So in running the Keeper, I know that you put up your ETH address and you put up its key file, uh, and it's kind of, uh, am I right in understanding that the private key is pretty much there, like, uh, in your bot? Uh, and if that uh, account has, you know, whatever, 10, 20, 30,000 die worth of MKR in it and it's participating in this, uh, what are different kind of uh, best practices for somebody running a keeper to safeguard uh, this kind of like... Uh, yeah, I, I can actually give you one right off the top. Um, let me share my screen again. Go for it. Okay, so in my example here, I was kind of, I was doing the easy way, which is specifying a pass file here, right? So this is just a plain text file that has the password for um, this mainnet account, right? If I wanted to, I could eliminate this section of the file, and let's just do this live, right? I'm going to kill that, and then I'm going to restart my keeper here. Okay. Now, when I start this keeper, it's going to prompt me to enter that password. Ah. So, I if I deleted that pass file off my system, if if um, for some reason somebody gets physical access or is able to SSH into my machine and gets rights to pull that data, they won't be able to use my private key without the password. Right. So that that's makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and that that's really just up to a matter of. Hey, you know, how many keepers am I running? How complicated is it to keep track of all my passwords? And uh, what, how do I want to balance the trade-offs between ease of running this and the risk imposed, um, you know, by, by having those funds there? Um, yeah, that and, makes you know, a lot what's of sense. The, uh, yeah. What's the security of my infrastructure, right? So yeah. you know, th those are trade-offs that everyone needs to consider. Yeah, sweet. That that's very informative. Thank you. Cool. All right. Yeah. So we got about a minute left. Uh, so with that, I'm just gonna say thank you so much, Ed. Every time you're on the call, it's just a total wealth of information, uh, and it's uh, you have such a soothing voice. So it's a total pleasure, even just to sit quietly and listen. So yeah, uh, I put on always my podcasting thank you. voice for this. <laughs> but yeah, it was a pleasure being here, and thank you for yeah. those words. Sweet, sweet. And uh, just as a reminder, again, anybody watching the recording or here on the call, uh, go to the Keeper channel on Maker Chat and uh, feel free to ping Ed uh, or just type uh, type in that channel. Several people are watching it kind of constantly and are happy to help you. So uh, yeah, reach out to us if you need help. All right, sweet. With that, happy Tuesday. Uh, and this will be posted to YouTube shortly. So I uh, hope you all have a good one.
Thanks. Thank you, everybody.